very much. It's very good to be here. I was going to say I was grateful to escape the atrocious weather from Toronto, but uh, it's atrocious in another respect here. But nonetheless, it's very, very good to be here. Now, it seems to me that immigration is really among the defining issues of our time. For almost five years, since June 2010, UK voters have ranked immigration a close second to the economy as the most important issue facing the country. In electoral history, in this country, that has never happened. In France and in the United Kingdom, the far right on the back of immigration is polling around 25, 26%. And there was a great debate in the last panel about what populism in the far right is, but governments in the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, and Austria have either governed with the far right or with their support. Much of this conversation since September 11 has been about Islam and Europe. And this has been a debate that has become polarized and ugly. On the one side, radical Islam, jihadism, or violent extremism appeals to a minority of Muslims in Europe who have, and let us be frank, signed up to a death cult. At the same time, this tiny minority has been misinterpreted deliberately by sections of the far right, media, and public opinion as representative of the whole complex and varied forms of Islam within Europe. In the area of forced migration, state breakdown in the Middle East, for which NATO, the United States, Britain, France, and above all, lest we forget, Tony Blair and George W. Bush bear a great deal of responsibility this has resulted in forced migration on an unprecedented scale. Almost 52 million people have been pushed out of their homes, have fled. Only 10% get asylum in the West. The rest are rotting in refugee camps or hiding in cities in the developing South. All of these migratory trends are embedded in Europe's ongoing crisis, characterized by stagnating economic growth, high public debt, and unemployment levels that threaten a lost generation. These are, that, these are thus depressing times, even by our low post-crash standards. But rather than piling gloom on gloom, I hope to use this lecture to articulate a number of propositions which, taken together, suggest that Europe's immigration crisis, Britain's immigration crisis, is not only manageable, it is solvable. And my remarks are really going to proceed in four steps. First, a brief historical overview. Second, a discussion of the economic costs and benefits of migration. A discussion of Islam in Europe, point three. And then a series of policy recommendations. Now, going back far enough, all European societies are immigration countries in that they're the product of great tribal movements. But the Europe we know, beginning about 1830, is the product of really five waves of migration. The first is what one scholar calls the great unmixing. This is the product of imperialism, nas imperial dissolution, nationalism, and the emergence of nation states within southeastern South Europe, a process mostly celebrated by romantic and nationalist historians but one which led to the expulsion of millions and millions of Christians and Muslims, and in the case of the Armenians, attempt, an attempt to destroy an entire people. The second wave began in the 1930s and ended in the early 1950s, and this was the result of the dictator's attempt, first Stalin, then Hitler, to reorder the Eurasian subcontinent, Eurasian continent. Stalin expelled Koreans, Germans, Finns, Greeks, Tartars, and all other minorities. Hitler joined in the expulsion of Slavs and added his own twist with the attempt to murder the Jews of Europe. This period ended with the expulsion of 12 million Germans from east of the oder neisse line. And that took us into the third wave, 1940s to 1970s, when Europe's post-war economic boom led to colonial migration and guest worker migration. Two very different movements headed to the same place, taking up jobs, chiefly unskilled jobs, in Europe's booming economy, 
that all came crashing down with OPEC in 1973. And from 1973 to the mid-1990s, most immigration to Europe when the doors were closed was family immigration and then asylum from the late 1980s. And then we enter the fifth period, which has in many ways been the most complex and varied. Family migration has continued, but we've also had asylum seekers, skilled migrants, illegal migrants, and since 2004, EU migration on a very, very large scale. Now, to say something about stops and flows, this is the rough picture here in Europe. And Britain, France, and Germany have long been the largest countries. There's a little pointy thing in this somehow. Oh, there we are, little red button, excellent. UK, Germany, and France were traditionally the main receiving countries of, of immigration. Lately, Italy and above all Spain have become major destination countries. And we should give a word to Belgium there, quite a large amount of such a small country. The German stats are slightly inflated because this counts foreign residents and restrictive citizenship regimes naturally keep as foreigners those who are citizens in other countries. In terms of flows, don't pay much attention to the overall numbers here because these are gross figures, not net ones, and hundreds of thousands of people also leave these countries. But this gives you an idea of where things are going. And what's interesting here is that in the case of France, you have low and stable. The United Kingdom, high and stable. In the three other countries, Germany, uh, Italy, and Spain, you follow boom and bust much more. So shooting right up the peak of the housing boom here in Spain, and then crashing right down again. Now, let's move on to the second point, which is the economic costs and benefits of immigration. I think there are few debates in politics, though there's some serious challengers, in which the gap between rhetoric and reality is as great as it is in immigration. Indeed, almost every argument you hear in the media, and to their shame in the academy, in favor or against immigration is simply false. Immigration is either a massive benefit or a great cost to the economy. False. Immigration is a threat to the welfare state. False. Immigration is either the solution to our demographic problems, the magic bullet, or it has no effect on them whatsoever. False. I'll take those claims in turn. Now, to talk about the economics of immigration, the most important point, if you fall asleep in the next 30 seconds and forget everything else, or if you're already thinking about the pub tonight, remember this. The economic effects of immigration, be they positive or be they negative, are tiny. This is the one thing that we know. And whatever they are, they're a function of two things, skills and state assistance. Skills breaks down into two other issues. All things being equal, the more skilled your immigrants, the more of a fiscal benefit they are because they earn more and pay higher taxes. is isn't overly difficult, and someone else ideally has paid for their education. The second point, though, relates to how the skill set of the immigrants relates to the skill set of the population in the country to which they immigrate. Where the skills are complementary, where immigrant skills are different from native skills, that's the best case scenario because they don't compete with anyone else for jobs, they increase total employment, and wages for everyone rises. Where the skills overlap, and I'm afraid they mostly do, it's a more complicated picture. And there you tend to have wage depression in the sector in which the immigrants come. Sometimes unemployment, very rarely, more likely you see domestic workers exiting from that sector. So the cliche of New York in the 1960s was getting into one of those funny little yellow roundish cabs. A white working class guy would turn around to you and gruffly say, where's it gonna be, bub? 
those days are completely gone. You will not find a domestic American in a taxi in New York City, entirely a migrant-based um, migrant sector. Now, again, whatever the economic effects are of migration, they're small. So in the United States in the 1990s, there was the most comprehensive effort, massive political debate at the time, California immigration was very politicized, to measure the economic benefits of migration. Huge expensive study took everything into account, and they found out that the net economic benefit of immigration for America is $8 billion. Now, as an endowment for my university, that would be a fantastic sum. For the United States, I know British endowments are massive, so I'm simply coming from, from poor North America here. But for us, that would be a lot of money. But when you take that into the context of the US economy overall, that's one-tenth of 1% 1 of growth, or 10 days economic activity on an average year in the United States. So to put that into context, if you alter coffee breaks one way or another, lop off a few or make them a bit shorter, you could easily recapture or lose that amount of money. Now, if immigration doesn't make us rich or poor, it does change things. So the main effects of immigration are in fact distributional. And coming back to the United States, what that commission also found is that the main, the main economic benefit accrued because of wage depression, and you saw a fall in average US wages from $13 an hour to $12.60 an hour. So a 40, 40, 40 cent drop. And that resulted in two other distributional effects, distributions to the immigrants, the new immigrants who capture that wage in the form of new jobs, and to the owners of capital and the way from workers. A further effect that you have in federations is spatial. Immigrants mostly pay taxes federally, but the services they consume, justice, health, and education, are mostly supplied at the provincial or state level. So immigration benefits the federation, and it costs the states. Immigration and welfare. This was the second of our second of our claims. There has been a raging debate within the immigration literature about the effect of immigration on welfare. And like so many people, we're basically having a fight with Milton Friedman. He pops up everywhere. He famously said, without finding the need to run a regression, he said, it's just obvious that you can't have free immigration and a welfare state. And this debate about the relationship between immigration and welfare has been incredibly passionate and divisive because, almost in a Berlinian sort of way, it suggests that two things that progressives want more of, welfare and immigration, are mutually exclusive. And progressives, more than conservatives, are used to eating their cake and having it too. The linkage between immigration and welfare runs through trust and through Putnam's conclusion, which I'm just going to take as red. I know everything is debated, but I'm going to take it as red for the purposes of this lecture. That increased diversity leads to a decline in trust. And Putnam himself actually said really nothing uh, about this. He was more concerned with participation, his view of social capital. But above all, British thinkers, David Miller, David Goodhart, and recently Paul Collier, have picked up this idea. And it's quite a simple one. Where trust declines, there's going to be less social solidarity, and we'll be less willing to allow those of us who earn well, our wealth to be transferred to those of us who earn less, because there's no trust between us. Well, like so many debates, this is a debate that works very, very well in theory. But when you put it to the evidence, there's not very much to support it. Indeed, there's nothing. There's been absolutely no evidence that increased immigration correlates with declining support for the welfare state or declining redistributive 
spending. Indeed, as ungenerous as their welfare states are, the two states in which the welfare spending has become more redistributive, redistributive sorry, I'm jet lagged, <laughs> are immigration countries that have publicly embraced multiculturalism, Australia and Canada. The exception of this, as so often, causing trouble once again, the United States. Much of this literature on immigration and welfare has come out of the United States, and there, indeed, you seem to have correlation between the presence of black and Latino population and declining spending on welfare. Well, people have looked into this, and they found out that once you, in fact, control for institutions, much of the difference between America and Europe disappears. There's no PR in America. PR correlates with welfare spending because it allows small left-wing parties into Parliament. But that doesn't tell the whole story. And many people have then, you know, whenever you can't explain something, what do you reach for? Culture works every time. So they said, oh, well, this is specifically American. They demonize the poor. They have this sort of rugged individualist view of the welfare state. And this seems to me quite wrong. What we have to think about here is program delivery. Welfare in America, in the main, is for the poor. And as a result, the main American welfare programs, aid to families with dependent children, which has since been abolished, and Medicaid have been racialized and demonized because they are for and de defined in terms of the black and the poor. By contrast, most welfare within continental Europe is universal and benefits the middle classes. And the one thing we know about welfare provision is where it's universal, it will have political buy-in. So flipping back to the United States, Social Security, the closest thing to a universalist program in the US, is the sacred cow of US politics. Coming to the United Kingdom, everyone loves the NHS, a classic universal program. So when the Tories wanted to take down the British welfare state, which I think is actually their intention, what do they attack? They attack targeted programs like housing benefit, which aren't universal and therefore don't have middle class buy-in. All of that is to say that it is the way in which a program is delivered, and whether it is universal or not, and frankly, whether or not we can afford it, that matters much more for the welfare state than does immigration or diversity. Indeed, I don't think they matter at all. Let's move on to immigration and demography. And this debate really rolled out like this. Those who want to defend immigration say, we need these people because our population is getting older. We're going to have to pay for pensions and health care. And then some annoying, clever demographer pointed out this. The number of immigrants you would actually need to maintain working age ratios so those under 15 and those over 65 divided by those in work, those between 15 and 65, is so utterly massive that no one could accept it. So the Germans would need 3.4 million immigrants per year to maintain their current working age ratios. So a new Berlin in Germany every year. Obviously not going to happen. Because of this, people have flipped to the opposite conclusion. You hear this all the time. Immigration doesn't matter at all. It has no effect. This is actually also quite wrong. Because what the numbers also show is that even small annual arrivals can make quite a difference. So the differences make a difference. So imagine a, a Germany without immigration. Never happened. Zero immigration in Germany. You would have a tremendous fall in the population from 81.7 million in 1995 to 55.8 million in 2050, a population implosion. You'll see this figure actually quoted in the press sometimes. This presumes zero immigration. If you have 240,000 per year, the Germans almost always reach that number. Indeed, they've asked they exceed it mostly. And that population falls to 73.3 million, so a much more gradual decline. The problem of age ratios does not go away. It's there. But immigration does two things. It makes a decline more gradual. A gradual decline is a hell of a lot easier to deal with than a massive one. And it buys time to institute other measures. Increasing the female partic 
participation rate in the labor market using automa automation, and though the Germans are going backwards on this one at the moment, increasing the retirement age. So immigration can actually play a very, very important secondary role here. Now let me say something about the politics of immigration. And this begins from the observation that, regrettably or otherwise, we mostly live in liberal democracies. And in a liberal democracy, academics simply can't tell, as we're tempted to do, the people what's good for them. They often have other ideas. Put another way, you can't operate an immigration system which, consistently, which is consistently opposed by strong majorities of the public. And this has created what scholars have called the liberal democratic paradox. Because scholars tried to identify where immigrants were popular, and they found out that they were popular nowhere. What the evidence seemed to show was that immigrants were only popular in Canada. Everywhere else, they were extremely unpopular. And of course, this created a liberal democratic challenge, if you will, and most scholars simply tried to ignore it, except Christian Yonka. Recent data, however, presents another picture, and in a sense, a more <coughs> hopeful one. Gallup and the IOM have just done a massive study, a huge N, and this shows a couple of important findings. The first is that there's, in fact, no consistent correlation between the volume of immigration and public support. Indeed, in the world's 10 top receiving countries, immigration is more popular than it is on average, and you basically have a split of about 48% each between those who want current or higher levels and those who want less. So not majority opposition as we thought. And secondly, immigration, where support collapses in a European contrast, is in Southern Europe and here, in Britain. And we can think about what unites these two countries. It's not the weather. It's not economic fortunes, which are now much better in the United Kingdom than they are in Southern Europe. What unites them is the fact that there is a widespread perception that these two parts of the world have lost control of their borders. And this confirms something I've believed for a long time and for which there's other evidence. Where the <coughs> public has the sense that the control of borders is lost, irrespective almost of the volume of immigrants, support collapses. Think of the event that always turns publics against immigration. 10 immigrants arriving in a boat. Numerically, it's completely insignificant, but the arrival of boats, because there's such a symbolic, symbolic violation of sovereignty, always leads to this massive, massive backlash against immigration. Now, these points about economics, about the welfare state, about demography, these are, if you will, general truths about immigration. But in the context of Europe and North America, these truths exist in a political context which, since 2001, has been characterized by really three related developments. The first, and I call all of these challenges to liberal democratic values, the first is increased Islamophobia. Opinion polls show minority, but much more suspicion towards Muslims than Christians or Jews among European and North American publics. And I almost, most, almost think more importantly, what you've seen is a relaxation of discourse constraints. People will blithely make comments about Muslims in Europe and in North America that would frankly get them sacked if they made such comments about Jews. This is obviously the far right, Wilders and Marine Le Pen, but think of the successful Eurabia literature. Mark Stein, Christopher Caldwell, Bruce Bauer. These authors have tried to create the view that Islam and Muslims are some sort of foreign import to the European body politic, an argument that's absolutely mystifying to anyone with even an inkling of knowledge of South European or Habsburg history. In Germany, Thilo Seretzin was the darling 
of the, of the talk show circuit and made a pile of money on the back of highly, highly derogatory comments about Muslims in his Deutschland Schaffseeschap. Germany is doing itself in. At the same time, we've seen a sharp increase in anti-Semitism. I had multiple calls after the events surrounding Charlie Hebdo from the local media, national media in Toronto. Everyone asked me about Islamophobia. Not one person asked me about Jews, despite the fact that five Jews were killed during those days because they were Jews. At the same time, we've had an increase in recorded attacks on synagogues, on Jewish businesses. There was something quite close to a modern pogrom in Sarcelles, the suburb of Paris, last summer. And though the evidence isn't systematic, there seems to be an overrepresentation of young Muslim men in these attacks. The third development is a different sort of assault. I was going to say not a violent one, but in fact, often it is. An assault on free speech undertaken by an unholy alliance of religious extremists and progressives. And this has a longer pedigree, going back to the Rushdie affair. The events that played themselves out after the Rushdie affair, we saw them again after the Danish cartoon controversy, and again after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. In all these cases, major liberal intellectuals, or those who define them as such, said, of course, we support free speech, comma, but caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad are deeply offensive to Muslims and therefore should not be published. And not one, you can correct me if I'm wrong, not one major British newspaper published Charlie Hebdo's caricatures after the events whilst we were somehow supposedly having a serious conversation about whether or not they were racist. Rather difficult to do when you don't look at the cartoons or the caricatures themselves. To, so, to sum up what I've said before, immigration has modest economic effects, mostly positive, but mainly di distributional. Diversity is related to a decline in trust, but no decline in support for the welfare state. Immigration will not solve all of our demographic problems, but it will help. And public support for immigration depends on borders being properly managed. And this whole debate has occurred in a context in which we've seen increased Islamophobia, increased anti-Semitism, and challenges to the liberal principle of free speech. How much time do I have? Oh, that would be fine. So on the back of that, I want to suggest some ways why, um, for going forward, some policy recommendations, if you will. The first one is to keep the doors open and the borders controlled. The second, to deal with that first recommendation, follows the evidence that I presented for. The moment you create the impression that you no longer have control of your borders, in Germany in early 1992, when hostels containing asylum seekers were being burned, in the United States in the early 2000s, the time of Lou Dobbs, if that name means anyone, means anything to anyone in the room, and the United Kingdom to agree to it today. In all cases, you've had a massive backlash against immigration because of, a because of a perception that politicians have lost control of the borders, and when you interview publics, they massively overestimate the number of immigrants in the country. So borders controlled, but open, managed. Immigrants continuing to come, ideally in very large numbers. And why is this? Because it brings benefits for everyone. Skilled immigrants, everyone agrees on that. There's no debate about the benefits of skilled immigrants. Even UKIP likes skilled immigrants. And if UKIP finds an immigrant it likes, you know that there's simply no political debate on that one. What I want to suggest to you that unskilled immigration, against so much of what you hear in public debate, also bring, brings great benefits. 
for the immigrants themselves, obviously, but also for the receiving society. And why? Lowering the cost of unskilled labor through immigration has a direct impact on the quality of life of the middle classes. More affordable cleaners, contractors, and nannies bring what are luxuries in many European countries to middle class workers. They free them up from domestic labor, labor and allow them to engage in higher productivity, and they make it much easier for women to enter the labor force. There has been a massive debate in this country about declining standards of living, while the parties that are complaining about declining standards of living are opposing the one thing that it could actually improve them, which is a large, even larger expansion in unskilled immigration to this country. Some on the left will decry this as exploitative. I'm always highly suspicious of anyone who describes an activity as exploitative when those involved in it don't recognize it as such. Huge numbers of Latinos gladly immigrate to the United States through family networks where they're told exactly what the conditions are going to be because they know that however badly paid a cleaner in a hotel is in Los Angeles, of all apologies to Ken, Mo Ken Loach, their life is much better than it is in Mexico. They go because there's jobs and because they want those jobs. Now, this leaves the issue of wage depression. The usual response to this is to say, this is quite easy for you to say, Mr. Tenured Professor. In the country in which I'm told academics are better paid than anywhere in the world, somehow I've been negotiating my salary very badly, because this is not the impression that I have. But certainly, I'm a privileged member of society, so how dare I recommend something which could lead to wage depression for those at the bottom. Well, I've, I've tried to look into the numbers for this, and this is using Christian Dustman's work, which I would strongly recommend. I think he's doing some of the most interesting work at UCL on this. Well, he did calculations, and we're looking at the kind of the pre, mostly pre-accession migration here, of immigration to this country from 1997 to 2005. And what he's shown is that every 1% increase in immigration resulted in a 0.2 to 0.3 annual increase in wages, or 3.5 to 4% of total wage growth over the entire period. And this is a wage depression, a reduction for the bottom 20th percentile, peaking at 0.7, so it's a gradual reduction. UK average national wage during that period rose from 16,500 to almost 23,000 pounds. Kind of miss those days, don't you, with these fairly rapidly rising wages. And so what this means is calling that 4%, immigration contributed about 256 pounds to the increase. Put it another way, without that immigration, wages would have been 256 pounds lower. What did it cost the poorest? Assuming 0.7%, which is the highest, amount of wage depression, it costs 46 pounds. Numbers are quite simple. It's very easy to use public expenditure or tax money to retransfer or to transfer those 46 pounds back to the poorest, or indeed use immigration, some of the immigration surplus, to increase equality a little bit, and you're still money up. During this period, EEA, uh, sorry, during a slightly different period, a broader period, a longer period bringing accession migrants into this. EEA migrants, East European migrants, contributed 20, 25 billion pounds into social services, into the state, more than they took in services. So win, win, win. Unfortunately, it's not always this good. During the same period, non-EEA migrants show a net fiscal cost of 75 billion pounds, which I should also point out is that many working Britons themselves take out more than they put in. So this isn't simply an immigrant story, but comparing these two immigrant groups, European immigrants were much more positive than non-European. What does UKIP want to do, incidentally? 
It wants to shut off European immigration and open Britain up to the world. So what UKIP is really recommending is that you get rid of the immigration that pays and you take in the immigration that costs. How's that for standing up for Britain? Why are these costs higher? Well, simply, non-European immigrants are more reliant on state support and have higher unemployment than do European immigrants. European immigrants to this country since 2004 have been, in fiscal terms, one of the greatest economically beneficial moves of immigrants, which makes the controversy surrounding it in some ways surprising, partly because labor isn't courageous enough to defend its record. But that takes us on to the next lesson. If immigration is going to work for a society, then you need to keep income support low and employment <coughs> high. As migration can swing easily from a net economic benefit uh, to a net cost, it is absolutely essential to keep immigrants in work. work in North America, in Canada, the United States, and in Australia is the basis of migrant integration. The whole system is about getting them into work as quickly as possible. Too often in Europe, they are integrated into welfare. And welfare dependency is costly both to society and, if you will, to the soul. In the absence of work, it is impossible in a market society to have any dignity and autonomy. Moving people into work, it's too complex to get into in this lecture, but the short answer is involves a little bit of TLT, tough love and training. In some cases, you can reduce income support and link, uh, and link welfare support to work, to work in order to nudge people into the labor market, and you simply can't have a welfare wage which is above a market wage. It simply encourages unemployment. And who concluded that first? That great Tory reactionary, William Beveridge. In too many countries, the welfare wage is above the working wage. The T of the TLT is training. You need to invest in training so that above all for the children of migrants, migrants themselves will generally state stay in unskilled occupation, the children of migrants can use training and education to rise up because you want to avoid a situation in which you have generational poverty trap among immigrant communities. <coughs> Last recommendation, keep the speech free but fair. As I said, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and, a, and an attack on free speech are all features of contemporary European politics. Many people will in fact dispute this tripartite formulation. Oversimplifying a little bit, the route downplays Islamophobia and emphasizes anti-Semitism and threats to free speech. If you read the conservative press in the United States, you know first of all that Sharia law has been imposed in Birmingham and that a Jew can't walk down any street in Europe without being beaten up six times within a single block. The left, on the other hand, read The Guardian, emphasizes Islamophobia while downplaying threats to free speech and, to a lesser degree, anti-Semitism. All three, I submit, are real and they require a robust response. And it's a legal and rhetorical response. The legal one is easy. Current legal prohibitions on anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim discrimination should be applied robustly, and they should be seen to be applied. Rhetorically, those who argue that Islam is some sort of foreign religion, people like Bruce Bauer, Mark Stein, and Christopher <coughs> Caldwell, these people need to be challenged vigorously the arguments are well known and well rehearsed, but they need to be repeated. Acts of violence are committed by a tiny minority of Muslims, and we are all too inclined in the case of Muslims to associate such violence with the faith itself or with all its believers. 
When Jews or Christians, by contrast, commit acts of violence, we think of them as lunatics, as nuts, who are not in any way representative of their faith. Few people think that Christian fundamentalists shouting God hates fags, or Orthodox Jews attacking Palestinian property and hacking down olive trees speak for all Christians or Jews. When the French socialist government had published its bill legalizing gay marriage, the strongest protest came not from Muslims, but from Catholics who were bussed in from the provinces holding homophobic placards. No North American Catholic would have thought these people spoke for them. Now let me say something about free speech, and I'll, I will stop with this after a very short conclusion. As I said, in the aftermath and the lead up to the January 2015 attacks in Paris, as in the aftermath of the Rushdie and the Danish cartoon affair, there's something depressingly familiar about this, substantial sections of opinion, Muslim and non-Muslim, have held that publications of caricatures of the Islamic prophet Muhammad go beyond the viable limits of free speech. This is simply absurd. The right to mock religion, any religion, is so perfectly within the bounds of acceptable free speech that it, it is mystifying to me that we've had this debate for two, two and a half decades now. In a liberal society, religious requirements apply to followers of the religion and to no one else. To suggest otherwise is to suggest that somehow non-believers should internalize religious norms of religions which they don't practice. This principle, however, has to be applied to everyone. There cannot be restrictions on free speech for some groups and open season in matters of free speech for other groups. So given that, or for this reason, existing blasphemy laws in the UK, in Germany, in France, at the local level, are an affront to the principle and they understandably encourage the view among some Muslims that Europeans operate double standards in matters of free speech. And in this regard, others disagree with me. I think the arrest by French authorities of the bitterly anti-Semitic comedian Dieu Donné in the aftermath of Paris was, however offensive his views and offensive they were, unwise. So what about offense? You'll hear this all the time. I live in a city, with, in a city where you can't say anything with someone getting up and saying, as a X, I find what you said offensive. So what about offense? Well, to be sure, publishing crude caricatures of the prophet is disrespectful and it's offensive. Not something I would personally ever do. But respect is a matter of choice and it cannot be mandated. No one has to respect anyone, and many believe that no religion is worthy of respect. Pious Muslims certainly do not respect philanderers, men who enjoy, men who enjoy the delights of gay saunas, or women who like a drink. And this last point raises a further issue. Islam is a large, complex, and I'm not one of those, like so many in the media, who declares himself a part-time theologian. Ah, and all the demands of Islam, they're not relevant to my talk or my work. But this point is, Islam is a large and complex religion. Prohi prohibitions of portrayals of the Prophet apply only to Sunni and not to Shia Muslims. And all things equal, the most religious among any group, including Muslims, are the ones who are most likely to take religious requirements most seriously. All things being equal again, the most conservative and orthodox members of any religion are those who will adopt the most literal, uncompromising, and often selective views of religious texts. Compare, if you will, attitudes towards the Bible and towards Leviticus among Church of England followers in Islington, on the one hand, with Pentecostals in the southern United States. And what this, in turn, means is that those most demanding of respect and religious accommodation in matters of free speech are those least likely to extend it to others, such as gays 
or Muslims. And if you doubt that, just follow the Muslim Council of Britain's interventions on homosexuality or on Holocaust Memorial Day over the last 15 years. And that academics and liberal commentators would align themselves with such a fundamentally illiberal lot strikes me as mystifying. It's also, frankly, deeply condescending. Above all, to moderate Muslims. Because it suggests this idea that somehow other people are to internalize Islamic norms, that other people are to respect prohibitions on caricatures of the prophet. It suggests that somehow Muslims are not quite as good as the rest of us, can't quite live up to the rules that apply to anyone else, and therefore they need a pass. The sort of pass, incidentally, which the liberal academy, including some of exactly the same people, absolutely refused to give to Christian fundamentalists in the 1980s when they demanded, for example, revisions to America's educational system. They were told, quite rightly, to get stuffed. No less a thinker than the great political philosopher Charles Taylor says in his 1994 book that Muslims cannot understand the distinction between religion and politics. It is hard, I submit, to imagine a more patronizing statement. Now, to summarize the arguments I've made in this lecture, immigration produces modest but positive economic benefits. It poses no threat to the welfare state. And it delays and makes population aging and decline more manageable. When it is skilled, it's welcome everywhere. When it is unskilled, it raises the prospects of providing benefits for both the immigrant, whose wages increase, and for the middle classes who improve their quality of life through increased access to cheaper labor. Public opinion, as we all know in this country, can be very skeptical about immigration. But when borders are controlled and migration managed, then immigrants and immigration enjoy much more support. Finally, lower income support and ideally dynamic labor markets help ensure that migrants are incorporated into work rather than into welfare. All of this is what matters most, but beyond getting this political economy of immigration, this political economy of integration, right as a parallel task of combating the three assaults on liberal democratic values, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and an assault often by those who regard themselves as paragons of liberalism on free speech. Now, before I stop, Given my current place of employment in Toronto and in Canada, which is home to the high priests of multiculturalism, it would be remiss of me to say nothing about the role that multiculturalism plays in integrating immigrants. So let me say this. It plays absolutely no role. It has nothing to do, multiculturalism has nothing at all to do with a relative success of immigration and immigration policy in Canada, and it's certainly no model for Europe. Canada, Canada's immigration policy, like Australia's immigration policy, succeeds because it attracts highly skilled immigrants and it channels them into work. And that is the broadest lesson. Immigration works when immigrants work. Thank you very much. <laughs>